we're here, we're going to continue our series called Disappointment with God. Now, uh, it's been awesome uh, as a pastor for me personally, um, going into this series, we, we were kind of worried on staff. I mean, we, we really felt like you know, this was the topic that God was calling us to, to preach on, and, and this is you know, what God was you know, really laying on our hearts, but it sounds like a downer. You know, it just sounds like just, ugh. And I'm like, man, do we really want people to end their summer with like disappointing God? You know, like, but then the, over the last couple weeks, can I just tell you how many emails How many conversations I've had with people who are just saying, this is exactly what I needed. This is exactly how I felt. I didn't even realize that, I mean, this was okay to even talk about this, but this was what I was going through. And so uh, I'm I'm amazed and I'm honored by what God is doing through this. So um, if you missed any part of the series, you can go on YouTube, you can catch up. The, The first week, basically, we started off this whole series by dispelling some myths. Because here's what happens for everyone. Life gets hard, life gets difficult. Our circumstances become less than ideal. And the question is, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? And the, and the lies that we start to tell ourselves is that, well, God is absent or, or, or he's angry or he's apathetic. He just doesn't care about us. And so we talked about that for the first week. Uh, last week, Dave was here, lead pastor, and, and, and he talked about some truths, some truths that, that are in Scripture that, that tell us that even when we're going through a tough time, even when we're tempted to be disappointed in God, the truth is whatever hardship we are enduring, there is a promise and a purpose for what we're going through. There is a, a, a promise that God will be with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Even if we don't feel it, he's still there, and there's a purpose that our, our, our sufferings are not in vain, that God ultimately works things out for the good of his kingdom, the good of those who love him. And we may not even realize the purpose in our lifetime, but we can always hold on to the promise. And so for our time today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna read some more from the Apostle Paul, and, and we're gonna look at some kind of action steps, some things that we can do in our life to strengthen, strengthen our, our relationship with God, to strengthen our connection with God, to help us to avoid seasons of disappointment with God. Because the season really, it really it's, it's about our emotion. I mean, God is who God always was. God does not change. The disappointment comes from our circumstances. And, and here's the thing. For me, I, I think a lot of times the disappointment is a byproduct of being discontent. Just, just being discontent in life. It's not one thing. It's not one cataclysmic you know, event that causes you to doubt God or to be disappointed in God. It's just this just general discontent that you live in every day of your life. And that just grows and festers to the point where maybe you, maybe you never even truly believed in God or given your life to God because of your life up to this point. You're just like, I am so just unfulfilled, so discontent. And if God was real, then he would do something about that. He must not be. And so I don't even want to deal with that. Maybe you came here today with a family member or a friend. And if you're being honest, that's your posture and where you are in your faith. I want to suggest maybe there's a way that we can tackle this discontentment. And maybe we could change it in our lives. Because we, we all feel it. Right? Human beings, I mean, this, it, that's it's how we kind of function. We function in the state of being discontent. And, and, and usually in our culture, right, and, and it's usually some kind of like luxury item. Like maybe for you, discontentment, you know, maybe it looks like, you know, whatever car you drive, whatever year it is, you're like, you know what, I could use a year newer. I could use something with a little less miles. I could use something dependable, right? And, and I need to buy a new car. Or maybe for you, it's, you know, you, you can look in your, your closet and be surrounded by racks and racks of clothes and shoes and just go, you know what, but I need some newer looks. I mean, I've, I've, I've worn that once and I just really need something, you know, better. And here's the thing, we can all kind of chuckle and laugh at when discontentment comes with luxury items because we realize that's kind of futile. But here's what happens. What happens when you're discontent? with necessities. What happens when you're discontent 
with, with the things that you feel are essential to your life. You're discontent with your level of income because it's not providing for your family and you're discontent with the struggle that you face every single day. What happens when you're discontent with the family in which you were born into and you have no control to change and nor can you do anything about it? You're just now in that. What happens when you're discontent with your children? Some of the teenagers in the room are like, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> but honestly, or maybe you have adult children that, that are now estranged and you're, you're discontent with your relationship but there's nothing you could do about it. What happens when you're discontent with the areas in your life that you feel are necessities? Because here's what tends to happen. We tend to start then, and, just, and not even intentionally, we just tend to start looking at other people's lives and other people's life always looks better. In fact, I love the way Paul puts this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He picks it up in verse 12. He says this. He says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. I mean, basically, it's kind of like a tongue twister when you read it like that. But, but what Paul is getting at is for, for you, for me, for followers of God, we need to resist comparing to others. I think a huge step to contentment is resist comparing your life to others. Because what happens is when you compare, you lose every time. When you compare, you lose every time. You either lose because you compare with someone who has more or someone who has better or someone who has happier and you look at them and, and, and you are discontent because you see their life and that's the life that you should have had. That's the family that you should have had. That's the support, the love that you should have had and now you're coveting them. Now you're, go, you're, you're longing with them and you're discontent with your lot in life. Or you compare down. And you, and you look down on someone else or some other circumstance or some other social group or some other, yeah, and then you go, oh, I am, yeah, you know, we have it so good. And, and, like, and maybe you, you get the sense of pride that we were never meant to live through. Or, and I'll tell you what, this happens too. Sometimes when you compare, you just don't see everything. Because I'll guarantee you, every person you compare with is facing a struggle that is killing them, even though you have no idea what it is. They may look happy, but, but they are going through life just like you are. And so I think about Paul, and in, and in particular, it's, it's interesting to me that, I mean, that Paul wrote these words. Don't compare your circumstance with other people. Because... I think about what Paul's circumstance was. It's, I don't know why, I mean, as a pastor, I mean, I, I'm well aware of Paul's life. If, if you want to read up on Paul's life, you can read it in the book of Acts. Paul, you know, comes onto the scene of history as a person who hates Christians. He hates Christ followers. He, he, he's persecuting them, trying to stop them. It, there's some scripture that indicates that he was killing them until he met Jesus. And then he meets Jesus and his life completely changes because he's like, whoa, this is real. You are real. And he gives his life to Christ. And then he starts living for Jesus. And you read the rest of the book of Acts and he's doing amazing things for Jesus. He's starting all these churches for Jesus. But then Paul meets the exact same fate as John the Baptist. If you are here two weeks ago, we talked about that. Paul was going around. He's starting all these churches and he gets arrested. Now, unlike John, John's going to go to a Hebrew prison under Herod, but, but Paul, once he's arrested, his only defense, the only thing that he could do to, to just prolong his life a little bit longer is claim his Roman citizenship and say, I deserve a fair trial in Rome. So he's taken to Rome, placed in house arrest where he will await his trial. It's in particular, it's interesting to know who is ruling Rome at this time. It's the emperor Nero. Nero is the cruelest of all emperors when it comes to followers of Christ. It is Nero who takes Christians by the thousands and feeds them to the lions. It's Nero who covers Christians with tar and lights them on fire to be street lamps on his property. And here is Paul in house arrest, awaiting his trial with Nero. 
the book of Act just con- the book of Acts concludes and just leaves Paul in prison. Church history will tell you that Paul will get that trial and he will be beheaded for his faith. But you know what never stood out to me until just now? All these words that we read, all these letters in the New Testament, Paul was writing them in that room, in that state, awaiting that fate. And these are the words that you and I go to for hope. These are the words that you and I go to for life. These are the words that you and I go to when we were having a bad day because our car wouldn't start and we got to work 10 minutes late. And we're like, oh, this is so hard. And like we open up the Bible and Paul's like all full of joy. He's all full of hope. Paul's like encouraging people, telling people, you could do this, you could do this while he's awaiting his fate. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth and Philippi and Ephesus and he's writing all of these churches. He's writing to his apprentices, Timothy and Titus. He writes on behalf of a fellow jail um, a prisoner who went back home, Philemon, and says, hey, you know what? accept this guy back. He's a, he's a new person in Christ. Paul is giving words of life even though he's waiting his own death. Because Paul knows it's not just about his life. It's about God's kingdom. Paul knew what stood in the balance, what hung in the balance with how he lived out his life, with the faith in which he lived his life. And do you know what hung in the balance? We did. The church did. And I wonder, when you're facing whatever hardship, whatever pain, whatever struggle, when you're facing the challenges in your life, I wonder what hangs in the balance of your faith. I wonder if our children are looking up to us, if generations will look back upon us. I wonder if we take into account what hangs in the balance. So Paul's writing these letters. He starts, you know, in in Corinthians, he says, don't compare. Everybody's situation is different. Don't compare. And then he specifically talks about this topic of contentment. He talks about it in Philippians chapter 4. If you have your Bible or a Bible app, you can turn it to Philippians 4. There's Bibles under the seats in front of you if you want to use those. We're going to put some of them on the screen as well. But I love just the hope and the action steps that he gives us on the topic of contentment. It says this in verse 10. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I like that first line there. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. Again, Paul's under house arrest and, and, and news travels slow in those times. And so the church in Philippi that he got started hear about Paul being in prison. So they send him this care package. They send him you know, this, this kind of package to say, hey, we're thinking about you. We're praying about you. And, and Paul gets it. And that's what kind of spurs this letter that he's writing. And he says, you know what? I just, I rejoice over, I rejoice in the Lord that you guys would sin that. I rejoice in the Lord that you would do that. And here's my question. How much time do you spend rejoicing in the Lord? Do you even know what it means to rejoice in the Lord? I think sometimes we say phrases like, rejoice in the Lord, like, amen. And we get home, we're like, what does that mean? I have no idea. You know, like, <laughs> what was interesting was Paul, and you see this in all of his letters, his circumstance does not define his faith. What God is doing is what defines his faith. Rejoicing in the Lord, I think it it looks like focusing on every good and perfect gift that God is providing, focusing on what God is doing. Maybe for you, rejoicing in the Lord means this week, going home, opening up a pad of paper and just start listing Start listing the blessings that God has given you in your life. Start listing every good and perfect thing that God has done for you. Start listing the amazing things that God has done through you. Start listing the people's lives that are being touched because of what God is doing in this world. Maybe you just need to start listing how what the kingdom of God is doing around you and rejoicing in the power that pours out on that page rather than focusing on one moment or one circumstance that is not ideal. For Paul, even in prison, even awaiting this trial, which is going to be his imminent death, he is constantly rejoicing and thanking the Lord for what he's doing in Corinth, what he's doing in Ephesus, what he's doing in Thessalonica, what he's doing in the world, that his kingdom is coming to its fruition and it's unstoppable. Maybe we would learn to be more content if we could focus more on that. 
And then Paul goes on and says this, and this is very encouraging to me. It goes on in verse 11. Paul says this, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. This is my favorite verse in this whole section because this is the verse that gives me hope as a human being. Because I think a lot of times we read Paul and we're like, oh man, Paul's like, he's like the super Christian, right? Like he's just like, he's so good, you know? Of course he has faith. Of course he's content. But look what Paul says. He gets this care package. He says, I'm thanking you for this care package. I'm not thanking you because I'm in need for it. For I have learned to be content. I love the word learned. Paul says contentment is achievable. It's obtainable. It's real. It's there. But it's not natural. You have to learn it. You have to practice it, grow in it, nourish it, feed it. I think about that with my kids, right? I think about my, my I mean, we, we first had our, our daughter, our first daughter. You know, when you have your first kid, you're like, we're going to be the best parents ever, right? Like, we actually read baby books with the first child, right? We were, we're actually going to keep them on some kind of sleep cycle with the first child. We're actually not going to let them eat food off the floor with the first one. Um, and I remember, we, you know, and part of our, like, you know, we're going to be the best parents ever, and we're going to teach our little angel sign language. So that she could tell us how great we are as parents. And she could tell us whatever she needs. And so we taught her some signs. We're like, please. My little angel will be polite and she'll say please. And we taught her, thank you. Just whenever you just say thank you, right? And we should have stopped there. Um, (laughs) But we taught her one more sign. And I don't know why we did in hindsight. We taught her this. (laughs) You know. (laughs) We taught her more, okay? Once she learned more, there were no pleases, no thank yous, right? I got one of those. I was like, whoa, (laughs) attitude, time out. But it was more. It was all more. That's the only thing she said, only thing she said over and over and over again, all the time. Sippy cup empty, mm, right? Out of Cheerios, mm, right? Heaven forbid I put you down for two seconds. Ah, like it's like just screams in this. That's all we got for like a year and a half. I was like, oh, someone teach this girl to talk, right? I'm like, I'm like baby, baby, look at me, look at me, look, Bella, look at me, look. Content. Content. Enough. Enough. And she's like, nah. you know, like just like that was our reality. But here's what's interesting. That doesn't stop with kids. That, I mean, That is exactly how many of us live our lives to this day as full-blown adults. If I said, what do you need? mm, Whatever level of money, income you make, you just need... Whatever job you work at, whatever level of authority you have at your job, you just want, mm, you know, whatever car you drive, the size of your house, just mm, like whatever, you know, relationship or family, you're just like, mm, like you spend our whole life just wanting that. And then when we get, well, all we need after that is just... mm -hmm. We spend our whole life striving after more. Let me ask you this. What is enough for you in your life? Do you know what is enough? Have you ever even answered that question? I think we just get shot off into this rat race of life with this myth that you will always need more because we always want more because that's what's natural. But what God says through Paul is that contentment is obtainable if learned. And what you need to be content with is knowing what is enough. In fact, I love how Paul puts it in this next little section, verse 12. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul saying he knows what does not bring contentment. And maybe that's what you need to learn. You need to learn what does not bring contentment. Your circumstance has nothing to do with your level of contentment. Whether you have plenty or you're in want, whether you're hungry or you're fed, that should have nothing to do with your contentment because the question is, what do you need? What is enough? And for Paul, he answers that. And probably the most 
popular verse in this section. This is probably the verse that you've seen tattooed on your favorite athlete. Paul says, I have learned the secret to being content. And he says, it's because of this, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The him in that is talking about Christ. The, the, the translation, it's, it's a little crude because the word do actually in the, in the Greek, it's more closely tied to this idea of endurance. Paul's saying, whatever I have plenty, whether I have plenty or not enough or whatever, I can, I can endure anything because Christ is enough. And maybe for some of us, the reason we're so discontent, the reason we're so discontent is because we have not truly realized Christ is enough. We have not truly trusted that Christ is enough. We have truly not lived like Christ is enough. You know what I think is the, the greatest danger in our lives? I think the greatest danger in our life, and there's a lot of young people in this room, there's high schoolers and college age students in this room, here's the greatest danger in your life, that you will go after more and you will get everything you want, that you will go after better grades and better jobs and whatever, and you will get everything you want. You will go through life just eating off this buffet of satisfaction, and you're saying, I'm gonna try a little bit of income, I'm gonna try a little bit of relationships, I'm gonna try a little bit of just, I'm just, and you're just going through life and you're getting everything you want, and then you're gonna end up on the top of this ladder that you've been climbing your whole life only to realize it's leaning against the wrong building and you're gonna realize all of this stuff in the world ultimately does not satisfy it is Christ that is enough it is Christ that gives us the strength in fact I love the way that Mother Teresa says that Mother Teresa puts it this way she says she says you will not understand you will not realize that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And I think one of the most difficult things for you and for me living in 2015 in the United States of America is to realize that Jesus is all we need because for many of us, we have so much. And maybe this season that you're going through, this season that's discontent, maybe this thorn in your side, maybe this, this thing in your life, maybe this is an opportunity for you to wake up and truly rely on Jesus in this area of your life. For Paul, it was prison. He was in that prison, and Paul says, I can endure all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am not in this prison, I am not happy, I am not content, because that is what is natural to me. I am content because I believe who Jesus is. In fact, I wanna give you these three words I want you to try to apply these to your life. These three phrases, I can't, he can, he can in me. I can't, he can, he can in me. Because that's how Paul lived. That, that's why Paul has contentment in this prison. It's not a natural thing to be content awaiting your death. Paul says, I don't have the strength to do that. I can't endure that, but I can't, but he can, and he can through me. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what your prison is. Maybe your prison is your, the status of your relationship. Maybe you're in this room and you're single and you're hating it. And you want to have a relationship because you're lonely. And you try to do it your way. You try to do it your, you know, get your way. And all that ends up with more heartache and more pain and more loneliness. You need to realize, I can't. He can. He can in me. Maybe your relationship is your marriage and it's, it's hard and it's struggling and you, you can't hold on anymore. You can't give anymore. You can't love anymore. You can't forgive anymore. Maybe you need to realize I can't. He can. He can in me. Maybe it's just your life, just the, the, the struggle of daily life. Maybe it's your health. Maybe your health is a constant struggle and there's a constant nagging and it's not getting better and all they could do is sustain it and you don't have the strength to face another day. You don't. You can't. He can he can in me. Maybe the reason that you're discontent in life is because you have not tapped into the true strength that is Christ in you. Because when you do that, you will realize the truth of that phrase, I can't, he can, he can in me.